Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Supplier Diversity Budget Webinar. It's part of our re resource workshops here at MLGW and through the MLGW Supplier Diversity Program, we are truly intentional in our efforts to provide practicable and equitable opportunities for procurement and, and uh, throughout the division through contracts, purchasing supplies and more here at MLGW. Our small businesses of America have suffered immensely during this time of economic instability and MLGW desires to ensure we help our minority women and locally owned small businesses recover and rebuild for sustainability and future growth. Through today's budget, the purpose is to outline our capital projects, that are on the books for the 2021 MLGW budget. We will begin today's presentation and I'd like to be to introduce our senior staff as well as some, as, as some of our presenters. We have Mr. JT Young, the president of MLGW. We have Mr. Dana Jeans, the senior vice president, chief financial and administrative officer. We have Dr. Von Goodlow, our vice president of shared services. And Mr. Rodney Cleek will be a presenter. He's the manager of MLGW Budget, Plant, and Rates Department, along with Mr. Orsby. Randy Orsby is the manager of MLGW's Procurement and Contracts Department, including the supervisor of purchasing, Kamala Mitchell, and the contract supervisor, Ms. Latasha Rankin. Thank you all so much for joining us. I am the facilitator for today, the Supplier Diversity Coordinator, Tamara Pate. We will now receive President Young for today's welcome. Well, thank you, Tamara. Good morning. I want to say welcome to all of you who joined us this morning. This, I think, is an important opportunity for us to be engaging with many of you, so many of you uh, with whom I know we've probably done business with in the past, we'll do business with in the future, but just those who may even be interested um, in how to do business uh, with MLGW. So grateful for your service in our community and what you do. And I think today's agenda and the discussion that you will hear today will be helpful uh, as you begin to understand some of our plans, things that we have uh, upcoming uh, over the next few years, you may be aware uh, that uh, over the last year and a half or so, we've been about the business of developing what we've called a service improvement plan. That's a that's just basically a been our sort of um, engulfing uh, project that uh, is trying to upgrade some of our infrastructure. But even beyond that, and there's a lot of capital dollars. You'll hear about that maybe from Rod later. Um, but beyond that, there are a lot of everyday needs that we continue to have that uh, we, uh, we, of course, include in our budget. We are about to enter our budget season here in the next couple of months. And so it'll be great for you to be listening in and uh, understanding a little bit better uh, how we do uh, that. So I'm uh, grateful for you uh, being on. I do want to just quickly share one thing with you and just, just to kind of give you a bit of a flavor of um, you know, some of you may have seen this before or been are aware um, of something that we call the MLGW way, which are our values. And these are things, these are, this is our core principles that really guide our behaviors and drive us. And so when you engage with MLGW, uh, I want you all to understand these, this is our DNA. Uh, we of course are all about safety because of the work that we do predominantly. It's a very challenging environment. Safety, of course, is paramount for us. And that's one of our uh, core principles uh, that guides our everyday activities. Integrity is so important. Uh, we are seeking to do the right things for the right reasons. As we even engage with you, as we engage in, uh, with other stakeholders, we always want to make sure we do that with integrity. We want to do it the right way. Uh, we want to know when we make mistakes. Uh, we want to be able to learn and grow from that, correct those mistakes. We certainly welcome your feedback. We've gotten feedback from many of you, which actually has kind of led us to what we're doing today. And we want to thank you for that. Uh, we also want to be sure that we <clears throat> take ownership uh, as we go about doing what we do. As, as employees here at MLGW, we want to treat this business uh, as owners would. Many of you know how that works because you own your own businesses. And so for us, a value, a core value that we have a principle that we have is around ownership and how we are trying to make sure that we pursue excellence um, in innovation and being accountable for the things that we do. Inclusion is so important. Uh, what we are about today is, uh, is sort of an example of that, making sure that uh, because we serve a, a variety of customers, customers from a variety of backgrounds, stakeholders from all walks of life, uh, we're committed to being intentional, as you heard Tamara say earlier, uh, about this similar diversity among our teams and uh, of course, um, 
among those from whom we purchase products and services. And so that's why it's so important that we reach out and make sure that we're inclusive in all that that we do. And then lastly, um, one of our, our values around compassionate service and wanting to make sure that as we engage with our stakeholders, be they employees, be they customers, suppliers, vendors, the public, that we do so with um, empathy, professionalism, kindness, respect, concern, and care, things that we all want to see um, from others. That's what we want to try to make sure that we exude uh, as we move forward in dealing with those folks that uh, with whom we do business or that we serve. So I wanted to make sure that everyone was aware of what we consider what we call the MLGWA safety, integrity, ownership, inclusion, and compassionate service is our DNA that helps us deal uh, work with all of you and others on a daily basis. So today, um, it is really my my hope and prayer that this opportunity is one that it, that helps to educate, um, helps you to be able to, of course, engage with questions or but just primarily learn and understand the, about the plans that we have for the future and maybe see how you might be able to participate. Uh, and if not, just to have a better understanding of how we do what we do, especially when it comes to projects we're budgeting for. So I want to thank you again for being with us. I want to thank you for the opportunity to work with you, many of you. Uh, and I just want to thank you for all that you do for our community. And so with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Tamara and we'll get started uh, with the program. Tamara. Tam Tamara, you're muted. Thank you. Thank you so much, President Young. And we will get started with um, our budget review with Mr. Dana Jeans and Mr. Rodney Cleek. And we'd like to remind everyone, if you have any questions throughout the seminar, please, in, please be sure to include them in the chat feature. And we are monitoring the questions and we will have a Q&A um, following the budget review. Tamara, so, this, Tamara, one more thing, I'm sorry. Did you introduce Jeffrey? I did not. Jeffrey. I'm sorry, I just wanna make sure everybody knows who he is. Yes, sir. Jeffrey Lewis is here on our legal team. He helps us uh, tremendously in the procurement and contracts department, as well as with supplier diversity. Mr. Jeffrey Lewis, thank you for being in the webinar today as well. We will now begin. Yeah, if I may just kick it off a little bit, Tamara, uh, this is Dana Jeans, uh, and let me, uh, Put forth my welcome as well to everyone that's on this webinar. Uh, this is really the first time we've done something like this, uh, specifically where we cover the budget uh, with a group like this. Uh, so uh, we appreciate the suggestion to, to do that. Um, what we're going to cover today, and Rod is going to lead the discussion, uh, is, is the budget. And it's going to be a little bit of a high level review uh, these are things that are in um, in our 2021 budget, and as President Young said, we are beginning shortly to work on our 2022 budget. Um, many of our projects are multi-year, so um, I guess not to worry if you think it's uh, you know we're halfway through 2021 and and then we have to start all over uh, for 2022 because that's not really the case. A lot of our projects, again. Uh, span multiple years. So you, you will see things in the 2021 budget that are going to be uh, carried over into subsequent budgets. Um, you, won't, you will not really see specific uh, contracts or specific purchases per se. That's really kind of a second level, uh, uh, another drill down uh, to get to that level of detail. But what we're trying to do today is give you an idea, uh, kind of from a big picture perspective of the types of things we're working on. And uh, many of these, if not all of them, will translate at some point or maybe have already translated into a purchase or a contract. So I uh, just want to give you a kind of a set the expectations of what you're going to see today. Uh, we also are planning uh, additional sessions in what we call a proactive procurement, where we get down to uh, more specific detail at that point. Uh, we, in the past, prior to COVID, would have uh, sessions um, in person. We would uh, have the uh, subject matter expert of a particular contract or purchase uh, on hand to, to be able to explain the nature of the work uh, in pretty good detail. 
and uh, that would give uh, vendors an opportunity to uh, see if this is something they might be interested in. So we we plan on uh, uh, trying to resume some of that in the in the future, but uh, for now, we're going to give you a kind of a high level uh, review of our budget, and I'll turn it over to Rod to walk us through that. Well, good morning, everyone. I appreciate y'all joining us today for this uh, kind of high level overview of our. Uh, 2021 budget. And as uh, JT had mentioned earlier, um, really a uh, part of where we're at today uh, is in part to due to our way forward service improvement plan that we have put in place during the 2020 uh, budget approval year. And uh, the way forward plan is kind of setting uh, a lot of our initiatives and goals as it relates to uh, especially infrastructure replacement. I'm sure that we'll talk about this a little bit more in detail, but uh, infrastructure has really come to the forefront recently uh, in, in many areas and especially at here at home. Um, you've been, um, we've all been impacted by the uh, Hernando de Soto bridge uh, issues and, you know, more recently here at uh, Light Gas and Water with the February uh, winter cold event that had significant impacts to our water division infrastructure. And so uh, not just locally, but you know, across the United States, there's been a significant emphasis on aging infrastructure. And uh, you know, I will just say that we have saw that and foresaw that actually. And, and so we were trying to be proactive in what we are doing with our infrastructure. And so that kind of led to the you know, 2020 budget and five year service improvement plan, which is a part of our way forward uh, process that we're going to talk about some today uh, in the 2021 budget. So, uh, this uh, document uh, is what we're going to be speaking about today. This is our 2021 budget uh, book, and you can access this on our MLGW.com website, and we actually will show you a link here in a subsequent slide to allow you, if you want to uh, go out there and, and download that and follow along, if you'd like to do that. Um, it's a pretty thick document to go through and I'll just kind of mention some of the pages that are important as it relates to this presentation today uh, as well. But, you know, first let me set the stage and just say that um, our 2020, our, our budget process in general, where we are on a, uh, calendar year, fiscal year. Um, so uh, our budgets are actually uh, begun almost six to nine months uh, before the budget is approved by both the board and the city council. And so we, we do a lot of due diligence when it comes to putting together and formulating our budgets. And uh, they are uh, ultimately approved by both the board and the city council. Uh, we're required by our charter and bond resolutions uh, to develop a budget document that I just showed you. Uh, and so it's very important that we, uh, we do that. It's actually mandatory that we do that uh, each and every year. Another interesting point is that each individual division must stand on its own financially. So, you know, you think of Black Gas and Water, you think of one entity, but we're actually three, three separate companies when it comes to uh, setting budgets and actually recording our accounting as well. So that's an interesting thing to, to uh, think about. And we will actually show you within our budget book uh, the various projects by each division, electric, gas, and water. And the other important thing is each division must be self-sustaining uh, by our charter. So we actually have to set rates that recover the costs associated with operating and maintaining each division separately. Um, so this first slide that uh, Tamara has, is showing you is just kind of giving you an overview uh, from, a, from a big picture about, you know, what, what size of an organization uh, that we are. Uh, we're actually almost a, a $2 billion uh, organization in terms of our operating expense and our capital expenditures. Actually, $1.9 billion is the number that we have there on the bullet. Um, within the $1.9 billion, about $190 million of it is uh, budgeted to be, to be uh, spent on what we're going to talk the majority about today, which is our capital program. 
in our capital expenditures within each division. And then lastly, uh, for our operations and maintenance, we spend a little bit over $400 million uh, every year in, in just operating and maintaining the system. Um, and so the difference between the 1.9 and, and the remainder is primarily uh, the TVA power cost and the natural gas cost uh, that we have uh, in part, as a part of our uh, budget. And you may have heard in the news recently about all the things going on with our power supply, but in general, we pay TVA roughly about a billion dollars a year for our uh, electricity uh, cost. And then we also uh, buy natural gas from various suppliers and spend roughly uh, $200 million a year on the wholesale natural gas costs. So that's a little bit of the other costs that are, aren't mentioned here as a part of the $1.9 billion. Tamara, next slide, please. So this is a high level overview of the electric capital budget. And you can see the link there at the bottom of the page. So if you want to go uh, get access to our budget book, you can do that. But again, this is a very high level uh, of what we spend uh, the majority of our capital dollars on. And, you know, you don't think a whole lot about your electric, uh, electric gas and water system uh, in the all of the assets and infrastructure that's required uh, to, you know, have electricity to your home. Um, so just briefly, um, you know, we, like we said earlier on the previous slide, we, we don't generate our power. We buy our power uh, from TVA. So MLGW as it exists today uh, basically is a transmission and distribution company. And so basically what that means is this TVA generates the power. They deliver that power to us at a uh, transmission level uh, service voltage. And then from there, MLGW's responsibility is to take that and to transform that and to send that down at lower voltages and, uh, that the system can handle and ultimately to deliver that to your house. Um, so what we're gonna talk about today is re related to the transmission and substations and distribution systems uh, that we have in place uh, that help us to deliver that power ultimately uh, to the residential customers. And we're going to talk briefly just about some of those projects. Um, just going back to the transmission types of assets that we have, uh, the transmission function is, is really related to the very tall steel towers and wires that you may see when you drive around. Um, those steel towers and, and uh, wires are generally running through a large green space, maybe even a farm. You may have seen those uh, very large towers. Uh, those transmission towers, you know, then run the power along to various different substations. You see the word up there in the first sub bullet of substation. So the transmission wires and, 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 and towers deliver the power to the substations. We have generally about 60 uh, substations in our service territory. And those substations then uh, are are used in, along with the substation transformers that we'll talk about here in a second to step down the power to the distribution system. Um, so you can see there in the electric and substations and transmission category that we spend quite a bit of money in that area. That's about $31.2 million uh, worth of assets that we have uh, that we're gonna spend on. We'll talk a little bit more detail about those. Distribution system is a bulk of the expenditure at $75 million per year. And then finally, the electric general plant at $44.3 million. So the general plan is kind of like a catch-all that's not related to uh, the substation transmission or distribution. General plant represents things like uh, equipment that's used, um, maybe uh, trailers and cranes and bucket trucks also, and maybe even actual trucks that you see uh, riding around with the MLGW logo. Also other things in general plan are uh, like radio communications and uh, also any IS type projects that may be specifically related to the electric uh, division uh, as well. And so, you know, just in the types of capital work, substation, 
uh, and transmission work. A lot of our work is regulatory in nature. Uh, we have to follow uh, NERC and CERC uh, uh, compliance when it comes to our electric system. It's highly regulated. Uh, of course, you can imagine with uh, some of the recent developments around the uh, Colonial Pipeline, there's been lots of discussion around security as well. So there is a lot of regulatory uh, work that you will see not only in electric division, but gas and water as well. Uh, reliability and system improvement projects. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that on the next slide. Uh, and then finally, just in summary, uh, for the electric division, uh, we, we're budgeting about $120 million uh, to spend in, uh, in capital infrastructure improvements. Next slide, Tamara, please. So if we look specifically at the substation and transmission projects that we uh, talked about earlier, this is kind of our first level of assets that are used in the electric system to be able to deliver the power to the customers. Uh, within that category, we're talking about $31 million uh, worth of, of uh, projects, if you will. And this is just a, a brief list of, you know, hey, what are the things, what are the assets uh, that are involved in substation and transmission? Uh, and, you know, we have breaker replacements, we have transformer replacements, relays, capacitor banks, batteries, uh, and things like that that are inside of a particular substation. So just to kind of give you an idea within the $31 million, uh, the transformer replacements are about 12 million of that. Our breaker replacements are about $3.4 million of that. And then uh, the RTUs, the cap banks, relays uh, together are uh, about four and a half million dollars. And we actually have budgeted this year a uh, mobile substation, which is very interesting project at 3.1 million. Uh, you heard me mention earlier that we have about 60 substations uh, throughout our territory. And, and about uh, four years ago, we actually had a fire in one of those substations and we uh, lost power to uh, one of the areas out towards Arlington. And so as a part of that uh, project, we was decided that we would like to try to uh, buy and install a mobile substation. So that was an interesting project that came out of, of that as well. So Tamara, next slide. Um, you heard JT talk earlier about our, our Way Forward initiative, and uh, you may have read some uh, information uh, about the council meeting that we had recently Tuesday. Uh, but as a part of the Way Forward Initiative, we really are focusing uh, a lot on the infrastructure that's related to improving our, our system reliability so that we can keep the power on, have less interruptions, and the interruptions that we might have, hopefully they're shorter in duration than they've been previously uh, in past years. And so as a part of our distribution system projects, we have about $75 million uh, worth of projects in that particular category. And I'm just gonna call out three here uh, that are significantly a part of that way forward uh, project. And in addition to this, uh, these three, uh, we'll talk about uh, tree trimming, which is not a capital project, but we'll talk about uh, tree trimming later on in, in a subsequent slide. But the three that we have outlined here are distribution automation. Um, that's, that's a fancy word that relates to really what I call a smart switch in the system. And when you install smart switches in your system, it gives you the ability to reroute power just like in your home. I don't know if you have a maybe a three-way switch in your home, you know, at the bottom of some stairs and at the top of the stairs, but it allows you to flip the light on at uh, various points uh, along the system. And so distribution automation is a very critical uh, piece of infrastructure and in a project that will allow us to help reduce the duration of outages uh, across our system. And within that category, distribution automation, just for 2021, we're hoping to be able to spend about $10 million on the installation of these smart switch switches in our system. And across the next five years, we're hoping to spend around $130 million in uh, distribution automation improvements. 
uh, in the next few years. The uh, second is the distribution pole replacements. We have, a, a, like we said earlier, a lot of aging uh, infrastructure related to poles. And so we're trying to be proactive in inspecting the poles that need to be replaced, making a list of those, and then replacing those uh, annually. And we're uh, budgeted to spend about $3 million in pole replacements for 2021. And we also have a multi-year plan uh, to spend on uh, pole replacements. And then lastly, uh, something called defective cable replacements. Uh, if you live in a subdivision where uh, the wires are buried underground, um, that's uh, the, the wires that you see that you don't see that are buried underground are these particular wires that we are identifying that need to be replaced. Uh, they're called underground cables, actually. And so we have a proactive plan to be able to identify those that show signs of aging and potential failures. And in 2021, we actually have $11.8 million uh, that to spend on replacing our underground uh, cable that is failing. Um, within this distribution category, there's a lot of other dollars uh, that are related uh, primarily to customers, getting new customers online. We do participate in investing uh, to get customers uh, connected to our system, new customers, new load. Uh, and so uh, there is a bulk of, of dollars within the distribution category uh, that are spent on that, as well as planned and emergency maintenances that may just happen uh, throughout the system uh, in, the, in the electric division. So on the next slide, we're gonna kind of switch gears to uh, talk about our gas capital budget. And so just briefly, I just wanna kind of, uh, if you've never uh, been introduced to a gas system, just briefly talk about, uh, you know, how gas gets to your home. Uh, natural gas is mined deep within the earth. And uh, when the gas is mined, it's brought up to what are called gathering stations. Uh, that are primarily are located south of us in the southeast part of Texas and also in the middle to western parts of Louisiana. That's where these natural gas hubs are primarily located. MLGW purchases natural gas from those wholesale suppliers. We have multiple uh, contracts with multiple suppliers. And then we, del we have the gas delivered on three major uh, what, what we call transmission pipelines, interstate pipelines from that area up to our service territory for delivering the gas ultimately to the uh, end user into the customer. And so, you know, when you say the word pipeline, you've, you've heard about the Colonial uh, Pipeline in the news lately. That's a gasoline pipeline that shut down gasoline delivery for the majority of the East Coast. And so, you know, as you can imagine, there's a lot of regulatory uh, compliance and a lot of regulatory oversight when it comes to interstate pipelines that carry not only gasoline, but natural gas as well. Um, so just briefly here, our major capital categories that we've listed are our gas production system. We say production system, but we'll talk a little bit about what that exactly means on the next slide. Our uh, gas distribution system, we're, we're planning on spending about $26 million. And then again, the general plant category is about uh, 15.5 million. And you can see again, the type of work that's uh, involved here is, is a lot of regulatory for gas, um, but there are also customer related projects that we mentioned earlier, trying to get new customers in online uh, as well. And so the total for the gas division for 2021 is uh, around $34 million that we plan on spending uh, in, in capital expenditures. On the next page is, is just a little bit of a deeper dive on the gas <coughs> capital expenditures. We just wanted to highlight uh, the reliability because it's so important in gas. Uh, and so the first one there is the LNG plant. So you, you saw on the previous page, we, we mentioned something called production. Uh, we actually uh, have a liquefied natural gas plant. That's what the LNG stands for, liquefied natural gas plant. We actually have a storage facility uh, that's in our south part of our service territory. And what's interesting about natural gas is if you cool natural gas down enough, it will turn into a liquid and can be stored in a facility. And so we actually have a facility 
that uh, will contain or hold about 1 billion cubic feet of uh, liquefied natural gas. And so we do have some improvements related to uh, the control system for the LNG plant uh, there at, uh, in the south part of our county. Also, uh, just talking about uh, regulatory and system improvements, uh, we also have about $250,000 in system planning and also our transmission pipeline system. We uh, plan on spending about $2.4 million in that area. And then uh, we mentioned regulator stations. So once the, once the gas comes into the service territory, uh, it's, it's, it's sent to the service territory using compressor stations that increase the pressure of the gas. And so, you know, if you remember your high school uh, physics or, or your science class, anything in nature likes to move from high pressure to low pressure. And so that's really how gas works. That's how gas is delivered ultimately to your home is through uh, these compressor stations and also these regulator stations that regulate the pressure of the gas in the system. Um, but, you know, you don't really think much about natural gas really until the winter season. Um, and I don't want to really call uh, natural gas uh, boring, but natural gas tends to be uh, boring uh, in some regard uh, when it comes to uh, talking about the projects. Um, the next page kind of gives a little bit more detail about the regulatory aspect of gas division. Uh, we're uh, planning on spending about $6.7 million in regulatory compliance projects. Uh, you've, you've heard us talk about our way forward uh, projects. Uh, one a couple of those at the top of the bullets there are, are vital parts of our way forward uh, program, which is the cast iron retrofit and the steel tap replacements. Those are both regulatory um, with the state of Tennessee. And so we have plans in place uh, to spend money around uh, those uh, projects as well. So I'm gonna move on to the water division because the water division has gotten a lot of attention lately, especially after our, our uh, February uh, event. But um, the uh, major capital categories uh, that you see there are production, distribution, and general plant. And uh, a little bit about the water system and kind of how it works, because a lot of people, uh, you may have heard some in the news about how uh, the system works, but you know, generally, you, you start with a, a well, a production well, and uh, you drill a well and you have a pipe down into the aquifer. And we are very blessed uh, to be sitting on top of uh, these large aquifers or pools of water uh, that are very uh, pure in, in that sense and require uh, very little treatment in terms of the water supply itself. And so we are very blessed to be able to to use the aquifers that the aquifer that we have. And so it starts with those production wells. And when you drill down and, and create a well, um, the water will come up and then we pump that water to uh, something called pumping stations. And at the pumping stations, the water then comes in, it goes through an aeration process where the water is kind of exposed to the air and, and allowed uh, to kind of purify and have some filtering done. Uh, through through uh, some filter media, if you will. And then subsequently it's treated a little bit, it doesn't require a whole lot of treating, it's very pure. And we're blessed that it doesn't require a lot of treatment from a cost standpoint. And uh, then it's uh, sub subsequently, it can be pumped out to the system or it can be sent to an underground reservoir uh, for storage. And so, you know, that's kind of a little bit about the components of a, a water distribution system. But you can see there we have uh, significant dollars that we're going to spend uh, hopefully on the production system and you can see the types of work listed there and the first one has received a lot of attention lately uh, the pumping station rehabilitation uh, just to give you some idea uh, one of our oldest uh, pumping stations that we have and we actually have 11 of these throughout our system but one of the oldest ones is the Mallory pumping station uh, here in our service territory and it went into service in the 1920s so you're talking about a station that's kind of physically uh, you know almost 100 actually 100 years old and so 
Uh, a lot of our pumping stations are in need of rehab. Again, it goes along with the theme of you know our aging infrastructure, and that's not just MLGW problem, but it's a problem with many, many uh, water uh, utilities throughout the country. And uh, so we really have an emphasis in our way forward uh, plan about the pumping station rehab. Also underground storage reservoirs that I mentioned as well, production wells, um, customer related projects, again, bringing new customers online. So the total uh, for our water system uh, capital budget that we have in place is about $35.6 million. And just really quickly on the next slide, Tamara, if you will, um, just a list of these projects. Uh, uh, we talked about the station rehabilitation within the pumping station itself. This is kind of a list of the items that are involved in uh, pumping station work or pumping station projects. We have a little bit over uh, $7 million, $7.8 million there. Um, the DPC system, the distributed process control, kind of controls all the treatment that we talked about earlier and where the water flows and how it's treated. Um, VFD stands for variable frequency drives that controls the motors and the pumps that are, are used to get the water out to where it needs to go. Uh, the electrical voltage breaker switch gear in the system itself is uh, very old for many of the plants. It needs to be upgraded. Also generators, we have backup generators at our pump, some of our pumping stations to where if we did lose power, we would be able to still operate the uh, plants in some uh, maybe limited capacity as well. And you heard me talk about the filter media uh, that, that is used at the pumping station itself. We have replacements uh, in, in, in those pumping stations planned as well. And so kind of related to the pumping stations, uh, but outside of the pumping stations uh, that you heard me speak of, the production wells, we really have an emphasis on installing new wells and bringing new wells online uh, for our system. As you can imagine, with some of our pumping stations uh, being very old, the wells themselves actually have useful lives that are at, the, at or near the end of those and so we need to bring new wells online. Uh, and so we're planning on uh, bringing, you know, $4.9 million worth of new wells online in uh, 2020. And then lastly, this big ticket item called the Mallory Wash Water Recovery Basin. Um, that's a, really a kind of a part of a pumping station. Uh, and, and that's a regulatory item that's uh, kind, of, kind of looks like a uh, large, uh, concrete pool, but it's used to be able to take contaminants from the water and uh, be able to extract those out uh, of the water system as, uh, for our uh, Mallory uh, pumping station. Uh, I believe this is my last slide. Uh, we've talked up to this point about our capital projects uh, in the 2021 budget, but I just briefly wanted to mention a few of the operational contracts that we have that are of significance. And you heard me talk earlier about the way forward plan. And one of the most important uh, things that's related to electric reliability and improving electric reliability is actually tree trimming, believe it or not. Tree trimming is the number one cause of outages in electric uh, distribution systems. And, you know, ML, uh, Memphis is almost, it's, it's, been referred to at the tree, one of the tree capitals of, uh, you know, the United States of America. We have trees everywhere. And so what happens is storms and winds come, trees uh, fall into power lines and cause outages. And so as a part of our way forward process, we actually wanted to ramp up our tree trimming efforts. And so one of the larger contracts that we do have in our uh, operations or O&M is the tree trimming uh, contract. And so in 2021, we actually have a budget of $19 million just for trimming trees. And so that's, that's quite a big contract. We also have other contracts related to environmental services that you can see here. Uh, a lot of this environmental uh, is related to our, our water system and uh, the electric system. And you can see that it's about 10.8, about uh, $9.8 million in our 2021 budget for that. 
also information systems. We have you know numerous uh, hardware software systems and the maintenance associated with those is a, almost $10 million. And then there's a couple of other smaller uh, contracts in our operations related to janitorial services and temporary labor uh, for uh, support of MLGW staff. And so I hope that uh, these few slides that we have kind of give you a overview of the uh, 2021 MLGW budget. Uh, like I said earlier, we are almost beginning the process of our 2022 budget now. Uh, it requires, as you can imagine, with it being a $2 billion organization, requires quite a bit of planning and time to put together a budget for an organization like MLGW uh, for the three separate companies or divisions, if you will. And so I hope that uh, this has been beneficial for you today. And I would encourage you to use the link in the slides that we provided to go out, download our budget book and take a look at that. And uh, if you have any questions, you can feel free to uh, send those to uh, Tamara or myself. Now I'll um, turn it back over to Tamara. Great, thank you so much, um, Mr. Ronnie. That was, uh, we're very appreciative of the information you've given a lot. We've actually had a few questions to come in that we wanna go on and answer if we can. Um, one question is how closely aligned is the budget to the IRP, if that's possible to answer at the moment, Mr. Dana or Mr. Rodney? I'll, I'll take a shot at that and Dana can, can uh, chime in as well. But, you know, currently, um, well, let me back up and talk about the IRP. So the IRP was actually uh, started in 2019 and out of the IRP came the uh, IRP document. And then subsequent to the IRP document, we've uh, been instructed now uh, by our board and council to proceed with an RFP uh, for, for power supply. And as a part of the RFP for power supply, there's also going to be a requirement for an RFP for transmission. Um, so, you know, currently, uh, as we said earlier, uh, all of our power, all of the power that we uh, use is produced and generated by the Tennessee Valley Authority. And it's been that way for many, many, many years, going all the way back to the 1950s. Um, and so our budgets uh, at the moment are assume that we continue to receive uh, power from TVA as we do today. Um, so as we continue in the process that we've been commissioned to do, through the RFPs, um, hopefully uh, when those are completed, um, and I believe that each R RFP uh, will, will most likely be completed ultimately towards the end to middle to end of 2022. Once we complete those, we will have information to be able to use and ultimately make a decision as to the next steps uh, for MLGW and its customers in terms of electric power supply. So I know that was a long answer, but the short answer is that in the short run for our 2022 budget, we uh, will assume that uh, TVA uh, will continue as the power uh, supplier in the budget dollars that are in and contained in the uh, budget document itself. And uh, I'll uh, let Dana kind of chime in on anything that I may have missed as it relates to the uh, IRP and the RFP. Yeah, thanks, Rod. Um, so one of the things to remember about the uh, power supply, the whole power supply issue is we have a uh, contractual arrangement with TVA that requires a five-year notice to exit that contract. We have not given that notice. We are still in an evaluation phase. That's what the requests for proposals are intended to do, uh, to essentially uh, assess uh, what, what might be out there to compare the costs of alternatives to TVA, to evaluate the relative risks against what we have now, as well as environmental impacts. So all of those dimensions are included in the uh, the RFPs that are going to be going out uh, uh, this year, uh, it will take a while to evaluate those. Uh, this is a big decision 
so uh, stay tuned on how that goes. But for the moment, uh, our budgets do not include uh, any uh, prospective uh, development of generation or transmission beyond our normal operation. Thank you so much. We, you actually answered the next question um, within your discussion, but the question was just so everyone will know um, that uh, regarding the capital program budget and the ops maintenance budget, not equaling $1.9 billion, but you did mention additional costs were due to TBA costs as well as the natural gas costs. If you want to, is that, yeah, that that's, do you want to elaborate? No, that's correct. Um, you know, when we, uh, for those particular line items, uh, in operating the company, we, you know, we, we essentially pass those costs through uh, to the customer. And so what's left over is really what we have to operate and maintain, you know, the systems that we talked about. So that's correct. Thank you, sir. Next, will the 2022 budget include generation construction capital funding? I think Dana just uh, elaborated on that in his previous answer, and the answer is no. Um, you know, we do have the, like Dan had elaborated on the five year uh, contract notice with TVA, and so we still are at a point of going through the RFP process. And then once we get the results from that, uh, then we will have more direction on potentially uh, things like uh, generation construction. Wonderful, thank you, sir. Um, the next question is going to, we're gonna have Mr. Jeffrey Lewis uh, kind of help if he can. Currently service connected veteran owned businesses are not one of the categories of companies given priority by MLGW. Do you anticipate that changing any time in the near future? I do believe this is in regards to our classifications, our business classifications through the program. Mr. Jeffrey, can you elaborate? Uh, sure. So our classifications currently are based off of, based off of our previous supply diversity study um, that pretty much shapes how we um, classify um, the different classifications for supply diversity. Um, so right now that is not included. Um, veteran owned business is not included. Um, the plan is for that department supply diversity to put out put out an RFP in the future, which will um, examine our current disparities in the market and if any other classifications need to be included. So the, the roundabout answer is the saying, it will be considered through that process, but we have to get our disparity study off and complete it. And then our executive staff will, will evaluate that when the study comes back. Thank you, Mr. Jeffrey. Um, the additional question is in regards to um, our RFP submittals, is there a particular scheduling software that MLGW prefers? And our staff did, um, thanks to uh, our Latasha Rankin is our um, contracts supervisor who did respond and that our RFP submittals are received via mail or email. And an additional question also included, how do we go about bidding for these contracts. And um, Tasha also responded, you can visit mlgw.com slash bids and our contract opportunities are advertised in the Memphis Daily News and MLGW's online bid notification portal. Which brings us to the next portion of the webinar. We do want to keep everyone informed how you can um, receive information about upcoming bid opportunities with MLGW. We do have our procurement and contracts department here at MLGW, which is responsible for the most cost effective method of procuring materials, products and services for Memphis Light, Gas and Water Division. So those departments may respond to the needs of the citizens and the three areas within the procurement and contracts department includes contract management, which facilitates the contracts for services from contractors as well as consultants. The purchasing area, which oversees the procurement of goods and materials and our supplier diversity area, which seeks to provide maximum opportunities for certified minority women and local owned businesses. Our department on, on today's webinar as well, again, includes our manager, Mr. Randy Orsby, Ms. Tasha Rankin, our contract management supervisor, 
Kamala Mitchell, our purchasing supervisor, as well as myself, the supplier diversity coordinator. Um, we are always available if you have any questions or concerns regarding bidding opportunities or the process in which to bid. You can give anyone um, an email or you can call during office hours here at MLGW. We just want to remind you all, yes, we are very intentional in encouraging growth of minority women and local small businesses by giving them an opportunity to bid and participate in contracts for goods and services. The three classifications um, that someone asked about earlier, the three classifications that we do accept here in MLGW, part of our supplier diversity program, include minority-owned businesses, women-owned businesses, as well as local small businesses. The minority-owned businesses, you must be at least 51% owner, operator, or controller of um, your company as a minority, as well as a U.S. citizen, not just a resident, um, not necessarily a resident of Memphis, but a U.S. citizen is um, the part of the classification for a minor minority-owned business. We also describe minorities as African Americans, Native Americans, Hispanic Americans, and Asian Pacific Americans. The women-owned business enterprises include any woman or female um, or groups of females that are also U.S. citizens and own, operate, and control at least 51% of the entity. In our local owned small business enterprise, you have to be headquartered here in Shelby County, your physical office. You must also have annual gross sales according to the SIC category limits, and you must be an independent and continuing enterprise for profit, performing a commercially useful function, also owning, operating, and independently controlling at least 51% as a resident or residents of Memphis statistical area. We do have agencies that we accept certifications from, including the Mid-South Minority Business Council Continuum's Uniform Certification Agency. We accept their minority business enterprise, their women-owned business enterprise, as well as their local small business enterprise known as LSB. From the Women's Business Enterprise National Council, known as WeBank, we accept the Women's Business Enterprise, WBE. From the National Minority and Tri-State Minority Supplier Development Councils, we accept the Minority Business Enterprise certifications, also MBE. The National Minority Supplier Council also has regional um, areas throughout the country in which we accept their certifications also. And the city of Memphis locally also certifies. We accept their minority business enterprise, the women-owned business enterprise, and their small business enterprise known as the SBE. The small business enterprise along with the local small business enterprise are both um, required to be a part of the sheltered market program here at MLGW. Our um, portal, mlgw.com slash bids. Our website is where you can register to do business with us, register your company's profile, including the services and products that you provide. And when a bid matches your profile, you will be notified through email. And we also encourage everyone to check on a regular basis. There may be other opportunities outside of your listed commodities, but you still may offer services or products that could be applicable to your business. So please check your emails regularly in that portal also. The iSupplier portal is where you will receive solicitations. Um, you can quote solicitations, you can review purchase orders and shipment details, including um, invoices for purchases here at MLGW. Again, that's mlgw.com slash bids. We'd just like to let everyone know we do have um, a new system that we are implementing. We're excited about the B2G Now software coming soon here at MLGW. The website is mlgw.diversitycompliance.com. And on this website, you will be able to um, track information. If you are a subcontractor, we do ask that you report your information regarding any contracts that you are a part of with prime contractors here at MLGW. It includes contract compliance. It includes um, reporting as well, goal setting, and more. It's a very valuable 
valuable um, tool that we'll use and other local agencies use it as well, utilize the information as well to ensure that we have accurate reports um, here in the company. There will be a training seminar. The next webinar is on May 27th at 10 a.m. It is a contract compliance reporting um, seminar for all new and interested vendors. Please check it out at mlgw.diversitycompliance.com. And that concludes today's um, session, our webinar. Thank you so much for joining us. If you have any additional questions, you can always give us a call or email us. I am Tammy. You can email tpates at mlgw.org as well as T Bird, our program representative, Tiffany Bird. Email us here at MLGW or call 901 528 4635. I think we did have additional questions um, that we will discuss at this time, the slides. Yes, we will have the slides available today. Um, you all can receive a follow-up email for everyone that has registered for the webinar. We can follow up and send you additional information. You can always remember to check out our website as well, mlgw.com. We had one more question. We are a local production company wanting to provide our services. We can help here. Okay, uh, we, I see that we have your information. You can email me directly if you have any questions regarding um, your services or your products being offered to MLGW. We hold what we call vendor opportunity meetings, uh, vendor business meetings, where we review your capability statement, as well as we can um, review what you offer and match you to the, the correct uh, department here at MLGW with that information that could help uh, get you connected and get you doing business with us. So we'll be sure to email you that information. And that is it for me. Are there any other questions or any comments from our team here at MLGW? I'd just like to say we appreciate the interest. I've looked at the number of participants that we're on and uh, it's a pretty large number and that uh, we certainly uh, appreciate the interest and uh, we look forward to uh, hopefully doing business with many of you. Wonderful. Thank you all again. And we will have this information available to everyone that has participated. Thank you so much for your interest. As Mr. Dana said, you all have a great day and we will email everyone follow-up information. Thank you all. Have a great one. Thank you.